This is part 106 of jQuery tutorial. In this video, we'll discuss how to use database data with jQuery Data Tables plugin. In part 105 of this video series, we had an introduction to jQuery Data Tables plugin. In that video, all the data was hard-coded on the page. In this video, we'll discuss how to retrieve data from a database table like this and then use that data with jQuery data tables plugin. There are several ways to load data into data tables. If the data set is small, then we can load all data at once and all the processing that is performing search, sort, paging, etc. can be done on the client side. On the other hand, if the data set is huge, then it does not make any sense to load all data at once from a performance standpoint. In that case, we load a subset of data and all the processing that is paging, sorting, searching, etc. will be handled by the server. We'll discuss that in our later video session. In this video, we'll discuss how to load all data at once and then perform you know, all the processing that is searching, paging, sorting, etc. on the client side. So the first step here is to create this database table TBL employee, which I have already done and here we have the create table script and I have also created a stored procedure which is going to basically retrieve all the rows and columns from this table TPL employees so at the moment in this table we've got 14 rows so first we need to create the table and the stored procedure so now let's flip to Visual Studio here I have an ASP.NET web application project within the web.config file I have a connection string that is pointing to our sample DB database so the next step is to create an employee class. So let's add a new class file to our project and let's call this employee.cs. And this class is going to contain several properties which are going to correspond to these columns in the table. And in the interest of time, I've already created uh, typed the required code. So let's copy those properties from here and paste them. So if you look at the properties, we've got um, ID, first name, last name, gender of the employee, job title, the website URL, if they have a website, their annual salary, and their hire date. Okay, so the next step is to add a web service to our project. So basically, this is the web service that is going to retrieve data from our database table. So make sure you select the web and we want to add a web service and let's call this employee service. And we want this web service to be callable from the JavaScript. So I'm going to uncomment this attribute right here. And we also need some ADO.NET namespaces. In the interest of time, I've already copied, I mean typed the namespaces that we need. So let's copy and paste them right here. And let's go ahead and change the name of this method to a meaningful name. So we want to get employees. So I'm going to call this get employees. And I'm going to change the return type of the function to void because we are not going to return anything. We are going to convert the list of employees to a JSON array and then we will write that to the response stream. So within the function, we want a straightforward ADO.NET code to call the stored procedure and retrieve the data. Again, in the interest of time, I have already typed the required ADO.NET code. So I'm going to copy that from our notepad and paste it within our get employees function. And if you look at this code, again, it's straightforward. We are reading the connection string from web.config file. We are creating a list of employee object, and we are creating a SQL connection object here. And then we are building a SQL command object. Using this object, we want to execute this stored procedure as we get employees. Since that is a stored procedure, we have to tell that to the command object. And then we are opening the connection, executing the command and whatever rows we have, we are looping through each row. And while we are looping through, we are creating an employee object and populating all its properties, ID, first name, last name, gender, etc. And then we are adding that employee object to the list that we have created here. And finally, we are passing that list to the serialize method of the JavaScript serializer class, which is going to serialize that list of employee objects to a JSON array and then we write it to the current response stream. So let's go ahead and quickly test our web service. So we should have one web method available. And when we click on that web method, when we invoke that web method, we should get all the employees in a JSON format. Okay, so this is the data that we want to use with jQuery data tables plugin. 
So on the web page right here, on our web form, what I have done is I have included a table here. I've given it an ID, data table, and within that we have the head section. And we have got the headers, ID, first name, last name, gender, etc. Okay, so we have all the headers. That's all I have, you know, as far as the HTML is concerned, a table with the head section with all the headers. Okay, and we also have the ready function wired up within the script section. Now, what do we want to do? We want to call this web service and use that data with jQuery data tables plugin. So I'm going to use our Ajax function and let's go ahead and specify our options. So the first option is going to be the URL that we want to call. So the URL is going to be our employee service dot ASMX and within that we have a function and the name of the function is get employees. So that's the function that we want to call and we want to issue a post request so I'm going to specify the method as post and the type of data that we are expecting back from the server is JSON and when the request successfully completes this is the callback function that gets called and whatever data that we get from the server that will be passed to this parameter. So what do we want to do with that data? So that's our data which we want to use as the source for data tables. Okay, so first of all, let's go ahead and find our table here. So the ID of the table is data table. So let's find that using the jQuery ID selector. So within our success function, so this is the function that is called after the Ajax request is complete. At that point, we have the data that we want to use with jQuery data tables plugin. So I'm finding the table element here using its ID and on that I'm going to call data table function. Now we are going to specify the options for data table. So the first thing that I want to specify is the data. So the data option. The data is going to be you know this parameter right here. It contains all our data. So I'm going to pass that as it is as the value for data option. Okay and another thing that I'm going to specify is you know the columns for our data table. So I'm going to specify columns and in the interest of time I have again typed all the column names just to speed things up. So within data, so let's format this a bit, so within data we've got these columns or these properties, first name, you know, ID, first name, last name, gender, job title, website, salary, and hire date. So the order of these columns right here match the order that we have right here. Okay, so now with these changes, let's save it and run the web form. So when the page loads, look at that, all of a sudden we have all the database data. We have all the columns here and look at the header column names. They match with what we have specified right here within the header section. Okay. And you know for each header, the data is going to come from these respective columns right here. Okay. And at the moment, if you look at the column header, you know, the column name that's present only within the header. If you also want that column name in the footer, what you can do is include a footer for your table. So just like table head, I'm going to include table footer and I'm going to make a copy of this. Okay, so let's save our changes and let's reload this and now we should get column names even in the footer. Okay, and let's also get you know a border around this table and we have seen a small trick in the previous video session. So what I'm going to do here is include a div element and I'm going to specify the style attribute. So basically I'm going to set a border to one pixel solid black and I'm going to set padding to three pixels and let's set width to something around 1200 pixels for example. Okay, and let's move this closing development to the end of the page. Alright, so let's save our changes, 
reload this page and we should get a nice little border now. Now, if you look at the higher date column here, look at that, it's not displayed as a date, okay? So that's a JSON date string. So we want to convert that to a proper date. Let's say we want to display the date in uh, maybe DDMMYYY. So we want first date and then month and then the four digits here. So we want to convert this JSON date string to a proper date format. So for that, what I'm going to do is within our column section in our jQuery code, so here we have the higher date. So what I'm going to do is specify additional options here. Notice this is a JavaScript object, so we can specify multiple options here. So I'm going to specify render. So I'm going to associate a function with this. So when that uh, column of data is being rendered, what we want is we want to format that data. So I'm going to call this function and the data of the column will be passed to this function. So I'm going to give it a meaningful name. I'm going to call it JSON date. Okay, so you can give it any name that you want. So what do we want to do with that? Now, if you look at what we have here, notice that the date string actually starts from here right? And if you look at the number of characters there, it's like four characters in the word date. We have a closing parenthesis, five, and this forward slash six. So actually, since the index starts at zero, so the date string starts from sixth position. So what I'm going to do here is on this JSON date string, I'm going to call JavaScript substring function, and I'm going to ask it to return me all the characters from the sixth index position. And I want to convert that to an integer. So I'm going to use parse int function. So convert that string into an integer. And I'm going to use the date function. So new date and to that we are going to pass that integer. So this is going to convert that to a JavaScript date. So I'm going to create a variable and store that date within that. So now what we can do, let's create another variable, let's call month, and from the date object, we can use get month function, and this is going to return us the month, okay? And in JavaScript, months usually start from zero, so, but in reality, months start from one, so I'm going to increase month, whatever value that we have for, for month by one. Okay, so that's going to give us the proper number. And what do we want to return from here? We want to return date dot get date. So that's going to give us the date. And to that, we are going to append in a forward slash. And then we want month. So we have that in a variable. And to that, I'm going to append another forward slash. And then we want year. So date object dot I have this function get full year, which is going to return us all the four digits in a year. So we have date, month, and year. So let's save all these changes, reload this page, and look at what's going to happen. So now we have date, month, and year. Okay. And if you look at salary, for example, here, you know, again, we want salary to have that currency symbol. Let's say we want dollar next to every salary amount that we have here. Again, we can do something similar. So let's go ahead and hook up render event handler. So render, and we want to call this function. And let's pass salary to the render function. And what we are going to do, we are going to return dollar symbol, and to that, just append the value of salary. That's it. So let's save our changes, reload this page, and notice that now we have a currency symbol. Okay? And if you look at the website here at the moment, look at that, it's a URL, but we cannot click on that URL. We want to make that clickable. But before that, you know, look at this. All the columns now are searchable, you know, look at that, they are sortable, paging is enabled, and they are searchable as well. Now, it doesn't really make sense for website to be sortable, right? So we want to remove that sorting on this website column. And another thing, I don't want to include this column data in search. So for example, if I type 
Prajim here. Look at that. That word PRA is present in prajimtech.com. So, and that's why that row is included. But I don't want to include the data of this column in search. Okay, so I want to exclude it. And in order to do that, what you can do is here is our website column. So what I'm going to do here, in addition to you know what we already have, I'm going to say searchable false. So this is going to exclude this column data from the search. And similarly, we don't want this to be sortable. So I'm going to set sortable to false as well. So this is going to exclude uh, that from being sortable. So look at this. When we reload that, notice that we don't have those two triangles there. I cannot sort this. And similarly, if I type Prajim, for example, look at that. It says no rows found because no other column has that three letters in it. Okay? So it's excluded from search and sorting. And we want to make this clickable. So let's go ahead and associate a render function. So render and let's associate an event handler. And let's pass the website. Okay, so what do we want to do? We want to return an anchor element, right? So that's what is clickable. So I'm going to include that in a single quote. So href equals to that, we are going to append whatever we have in this because that's the URL that we want to navigate to. And then we want to close that angle bracket. And to that, you know, the text within you know clickable hyperlink should be the URL itself. And then finally close the anchor element. Okay, so let's save the changes and reload this page. And look at this. You know, now it's clickable. When I click on, for example, this URL, look at that, it turns to a hand symbol. When I click on that, it navigates me to prajimtech.com. And for some reason, if you don't want to you know, display the full URL, let's say I want to display only 10 characters, you know, because I don't want the full URL there. If, it, if the URL length is like 100 characters, I don't want to display all those 100 characters there. So to do that, what you can actually do is we can use the substring, so website dot substring, and I'm basically going to say start from zero at character and give me, um, you know, the first ten characters, and to that probably I want to append dot dot dot, indicating that there are more characters which are not visible. So let's save the changes and reload this page and look at that. Now we only see ten characters, okay? But look at this; those which doesn't have a URL. You know, it displays this dot, 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 underscore. We don't want that. Let's say for any developer who doesn't have a website, we want to display NA, not applicable. If that's the case, we can have a quick check here. If not website, okay? In that case, we want to return NA, not applicable. Else, we want to return this string. Okay, so let's save our changes, reload this page, and now look at this. For those developers who doesn't have um, a website, it displays an and for those people who have a website, it displays the first 10 characters and dot dot dot. And when we click on any of these URLs, we should be able to navigate to their respective websites. Okay, and for some reason, let's say on the data table itself, if you want to disable paging on all the um, I mean, at the data table level, here you can specify the options. So you can say paging, and you can set that to false. So it's going to turn off all you know the paging on the entire data table. So let's reload this. Look at that. We don't have paging now. Similarly, if you don't want sorting, you can simply say sort, and you can set that to false. So let's save the changes, reload that. At the moment, look at this, it's sortable. So when I reload it, now look at that. I cannot click on any column and it's not sortable. Similarly, if you don't want searching capability, again, you can use searching. And you can set that to false. So the moment we reload this, notice that the search box disappears. If you want to turn them back, just put 
put them back to true. Okay, so let's include all the features and reload the page. And look at this. Now on the first page we've got around 10 rows and then when I go to the second page we only have you know four rows and look at what happened to the height it is all of a sudden radius let's say we want a fixed width for the table what you can do is you can use scroll Y option and I'm going to set this to 200 pixels okay so set the height of the table to 200 pixels and beyond that give me a scroll bar if if you know if there are more rows to be displayed so look at this now with that option I get a scroll bar now so I can see the first 10 records and you know using scroll and when I go to the second page look at that I have the same height okay so anytime you want to fix the height of your data table you can use the scroll Y option so here is you know the output Thank you for listening and have a great day.